We in Claire believe that artificial intelligence or AI will fundamentally change the way we live and work. It is also likely to become crucial in addressing society's grand challenges such as climate, energy and mobility, food and natural resources, health and inclusive secure societies. Claire strongly supports the development of AI made in Europe with a strong focus on responsible and trustworthy AI for the benefit of all citizens. It supports the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and promotes two central goals, AI for good and AI for all. Following our establishment in June 2018, we have become the largest AI network worldwide, focused on research and innovation in the world. Europe has all the expertise needed to progress rapidly in the deployment of these technologies, but we need to direct our energy and resources towards building a coherent infrastructure to stimulate deployment and adoption, build up an effective innovation ecosystem and drive excellent research. Building on Europe's existing strength across all areas of AI with its strong universities, research institutions and companies, Claire wants to ensure that many of tomorrow's advanced technologies, products, systems and services are European and are based on and reflect European realities, needs and values. Trustworthy human-centric AI leverages a broad spectrum of AI techniques, including machine learning, automated reasoning and multi-agent systems. To achieve global impact, we need large-scale investments into AI talent, AI infrastructure, as well as the effective and responsible deployment of AI systems across all sectors of our economies. We need to invest broadly to support excellence in AI in regions throughout Europe. We need to invest in central facilities and infrastructure to bring together AI experts and other stakeholders to create critical mass and global visibility. Most importantly, we need to invest now. Join Claire and support us in achieving our inclusive and ambitious vision for European excellence in human-centric, trustworthy AI. The time to act is now. Join us in shaping a brighter European future. Welcome everybody to this session on artificial intelligence as a tool for mental health at the European AI Week. Today, we'll be addressing how this disruptive technology can contribute to one of the biggest societal challenges today. We are right now more than 20 years after the so-called decade of the brain. And in the meantime, we have seen tremendous advances on artificial intelligence. Yet, when we look at mental health, we see that uh, this continues to be an extremely difficult uh, challenge to tackle. The WHO reports uh, about 13% rise in mental health conditions between 2007 and 2017. It is estimated that between one quarter and one half of the population is affected by a mental disorder at some point in life. And the direct and indirect cost of mental health can amount to a 5% of a country's GDP. So it's not surprising that we are looking for tools to address this issue, to identify ways to better understanding what are these different threats that we have to our mental health, how do the brain and the mind work, and how can we develop no, new tools for diagnostics, for personalized care? How can we develop virtual assistants that can take us in a better situation to address this issue? So we'll be addressing this uh, point today from the perspective of the researchers, from developers, entrepreneurs, and from an ethical perspective to get a better grasp of uh, what can artificial intelligence contribute to improving the mental health worldwide. So, and let me welcome the different uh, speakers that will be joining us today. As I mentioned before, before we have the uh, entrepreneurial perspectives uh, by Anna Mikes, uh, who's been working on neurotechnologies as new ways for addressing these issues. Giovanni Briganti, uh, <clears throat> uh, psychiatrist and researcher in AI, bridging the technological uh, knowledge and the domain knowledge in the in medicine. Dr. Kutoma Wakunuma from the Montfort University, who will also will mention and discuss about how this technology should be addressed from a global perspective. 
And uh, last but not least, Simon Van Heindhoven from Icometrics is going to talk us about and share his experience on how are we currently developing tools that can help for mental health. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Simon and please let us uh, share some of your experiences, use cases and learnings on how can we make AI tools that can improve mental health. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction, Ricardo. I will be giving the perspective on mental health from uh, Icometrics. We are a relatively young company from uh, Belgium, a spin-off of two uh, Belgian universities. And what we are specializing in is mostly in the development of um, assistive AI tools that impact the care of uh, neurological disorders. And while you may not see any uh, words related to mental health in the title, we at Icometrics are convinced that everything we do also impacts uh, mental health uh, for the better. And I hope that by the end of the coming 10 minutes, you will be convinced uh, of the same. So we are um, developing uh, imaging tools that can help, uh, uh, help caregivers to treat conditions like Alzheimer's disease, and um, among other neurological diseases, this represents an in enormous economic burden on society. It's even uh, the biggest uh, contributor to the uh, medical expenses across the board. So not only in the treatment of patients, but also indirect costs, such as family that needs to take time off to uh, care for their loved ones that are affected by the disease. And since, uh, as we know, the patients, uh, uh, sorry, the population across the world, especially in, in the developed countries, are aging rapidly, the, we expect that the economic burden will only uh, continue to increase. So there's a very large unmet need uh, in um, stand properly addressing this, uh, this disease, which it's currently not yet possible. We expect that uh, over the next decades, more and more uh, people will suffer from this disease as they uh, become uh, older due to medical advances. Now, as I mentioned, we are convinced that we are not only helping to tackle this uh, neurological disease from a physiological point of view, but also from the mental health point of view. Of course, uh, receiving a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a very impactful moment in a person's life and affects the whole family uh, and circle of friends around it. It's a very hard message to receive. And of course, over the course of the disease, if there is no proper treatment as of today, um, the patient will experience uh, degrading cognition with all the problems that you can imagine or might, might have experienced in your surroundings yourself. It's also a, um, a side effect of the disease that people might undergo personality changes, which is of course a very distressful uh, development as well for themselves and for their family. Not only the patients and their close uh, circle are affected, but also the caregivers themselves. Um, as of today, radiologists are already under a huge uh, pressure, a huge workload in reviewing scans for a variety of conditions, not only Alzheimer's. Um, as of today, a radiologist uh, typically only has a few uh, minutes or even less than a minute to interpret a brain exam or an exam from another body part, which makes that the pressure is very high and chances of human-made errors are likely, of course, not to the fault of the radiologists. And we expect that with the uh, increase of, of Alzheimer's prevalence, the need for MRI examinations of the brain will only continue to increase meaning a direct increase uh, in workload for the radiologists and neurologists downstream as well. Luckily, there's some light at the end of the tunnel for uh, this patient population, because since uh, a few months ago, the FDA in the, the regulatory body in the USA approved a new drug that can help to slow down the, uh, the progression of the Alzheimer's disease 
provided that patients are detected early on. So this is uh, since many, many decades, Alzheimer's has been a very tough nut to crack. And for the first time, it seems that a breakthrough treatment uh, is at the horizon and might help in the uh, treatments. Now, the key word here is early, because uh, for the treatment to be effective, the clinical trials pointed out that it is extremely vital to be able to pinpoint which uh, people are uh, early um, patients. So to detect the disease very early on before it is too late and permanent brain damage has occurred. So this is where a company like Icometrics can play a key role um, because we are convinced that with quantitative metrics, we can help uh, to identify those patients early on and to steer them towards the right treatment for them. Um, we know that we are addressing a large need because I mentioned due to the uh, very high workload of radiologists, the very little time available to interpret these brain examinations, there's a very large um, variability. If you ask uh, two people to rate the same brain exam, you like, you're likely to gonna get uh, two different answers. So there's very little consistency. And again, this is of course a very um, expected result given the, the amount of scans to be interpreted and the high volume um, and the difficulty of the task. We're talking about very subtle brain findings that are, can be very hard to detect with the naked eye. So that is why we are developing solutions that can assist radiologists and neurologists to even find the, the very subtle changes in brain structure and brain damage or abnormalities that can be indicative of a neurological disorder. We are developing, we're targeting um, not a single solution, but a platform of solutions, each of which can target a particular stage of the uh, disease. Our flagship product is IcoBrain, which is a software that can uh, provide several objective uh, measurements of important brain structures, many of which uh, are important to identify uh, not only the diagnosis itself, so Alzheimer's, but also to differentiate between different types of Alzheimer's, which is very important in the treatment later on. This is important for diagnosis and for follow-up of patients. And then there's also safety monitoring, which becomes more critical because with a newly approved uh, drug to address Alzheimer's disease, which I spoke of earlier, um, there is, of course, there's always pros and cons. And the downside of these new drugs are that they can provoke severe uh, side effects in many patients. So these side effects can be very harmful, even uh, lethal, if they are not detected early on. And this is also where assistive uh, software that can quickly process uh, brain uh, examinations from an MRI scanner can really help the radiologists and neurologists to provide the best care. Other than this software, we are also looking at uh, digital apps, uh, such as our iCompanion app, in which we integrate or in which we offer a set of clinically validated tests for cognition, memory, and in which patients can also um, keep a diary to log their symptoms, such as fatigue, memory problems, and the like. Because of course, um, a patient is only at the hospital in the MRI scanner for one day a year or potentially a few days a year. And we want to also uh, be able for the caregivers to track the patient's progression improvements or deterioration those other 365 days a year. We are also trying to empower patients more by uh, allowing them to, in the iCompanion app, for example, look at their own brain exams so that they are very well aware of uh, how they are doing, um, how their symptoms that they experience relate to what is going on in the brain uh, we notice that patients more and more are interested themselves in being involved in the decisions that are made and also to just be made aware of, of how they are doing. And for that, we're also uh, hosting a website called, Al called ALS Imaging, Alzheimer Imaging, on which we provide curated content reviewed by medical experts on the topic of dementia and Alzheimer's disease to also provide a transparent and trustworthy platform where patients, families, and also doctors can find information uh, for patients that are affected. So um, 
to summarize, we are trying to provide tools that can uh, support the doctors and basically everyone involved in the care for patients to help them along each step of the way, going from the early diagnosis and identification of patients through the uh, differentiation of the, of the dementia type and also the follow-up and, and monitoring of patients so that treatment can be given in a safe way. And with this, uh, hopefully, uh, to provide a, a positive uh, impact on the care for this patient, also brain health and mental health. So feel free to reach out to us on our website or via LinkedIn, and I will be happy to discuss this uh, later today in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for this uh, introduction to the work that you have been doing on tools for Alzheimer's disease, on diagnosis or yeah, finding biomarkers to providing digital tools. And we'll be yeah, coming back to some of the aspects of developing these tools later in the Q&A. And let me welcome Anna Maikas, the CEO of uh, Neuroelectrics, a uh, neurotechnology company. And Anna has uh, long some experience as entrepreneur. And uh, I would like to, to hear your experience on how can the entrepreneurial uh, sector uh, contribute to addressing mental health through the, with the use of artificial intelligence and what are the current uh, challenges and opportunities in this sector, including, uh, but uh, not exclusive, to aspects such as regulation and uh, the, the, how can we balance the, these uh, opportunities and risks. Anna? Hi, Ricardo. Glad it's to great. hear you. Yeah, it's great to see you all. Thanks for inviting me. You know me since my very beginnings as entrepreneur, and I have to tell you that um, it's a hard road, the entrepreneurship one, especially on the medical device side. So I think one of the things that strikes me the most is how can you go from research to the market? And I think researchers, they often think that once, once you have a prototype, the world is bright. And I have experience in my whole skin how hard it is to go from a prototype to a real market. And I hope that through explaining a little bit the journey of Neuroelectrics, I can illuminate, encourage or discourage others of <laughs> the hard road of you know, neurotech entrepreneurship. So I'm going to share very fast um, what Neuroelectrics is doing and what are some of the lessons learned in our journey. So let me share my screen. Um, Okay, uh, view, uh, let me see, I hope I can do this right. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, can you see my screen? We see the, the, the screen, but not uh, with the notes. That is not a slideshow. Do you see the no the screen now? No, it's good. Okay, so very fast because I don't want to take a lot of my time. So why do I wake up every day? Is because and and do this I think very difficult job is because I really believe there is people out there waiting for which drugs unfortunately don't work and where I believe neurotech um, can play a role. And, and as you may know, our brain is a complex electrical system. And at Neuroelectrics, we've been obsessed with this technology that we have developed, which really helps to decode the brain from an electrical perspective, right? We want to read the brain, what is called EEG, but we also want to stimulate the brain. So if I would wear the cap right now, which I am not doing for the sake of time, um, you would, this is what you would see. This is the electrical activity on my brain. This is non-invasive under each electrode of my cap. I'm going to show you the cap. Uh, you can see um, the electrical activity. And what is more interesting is that any of the electrodes, I'm going to put this on top of my headphones now a little bit, but you know, underneath these electrodes, any of those can monitor brain signals, but I can also use any of the electrodes to inject currents into the brain. 
So this is called electrical um, stimulation, transcranial electrical stimulation, and it's very low voltages injected into the brain. Why is this important? Well, we think we can modulate the brain non-electrically, and this has been done since the times of the Romans and the Egyptians, when they used to put electric fish on the brain. So what we've done, and, and I can discuss on the lessons learned, is we scale up our company from beautiful Barcelona to, let's say, interesting and highly competitive Boston a few years ago. And as a European born, but scale it into the US, I think it has been a really interesting experience um, to go to the US. We started our first trial in epilepsy um, back in 2021. Uh, with Dr. Alex Rottenberg. And what we wanted to show is that electrical stimulation can be a new therapy for patients in need. So what we did in epilepsy is do 20 minutes of 10 sessions of stimulation in children that don't respond to medication. This is pretty significant because the kids that have epilepsy and don't respond to meds, they have to go through surgery. So after 10 days and 20 minutes of stimulation every day over the focus, we really have very interesting results. And let me show you how we did this. We ask every neurologist, and that's where the artificial intelligence part comes. We ask every neurologist um, to collect an EEG and an MRI of the patient. And we told them, okay, if the patient suffers from epilepsy, where do the seizures come from? So we ask them in our platform, to paint where the seizures were coming from, in this case, this area of the brain, and in blue, inhibition. So they wanted us to kind of modulate and provide an inhibitory current into the brain. So my colleague, Julio Ruffini and his team, what they did with AI and with very sophisticated tools is build a 3D model of the brain of that patient based on the MRI, and then compute uh, how many electrodes and what's the current for that patient to target that area. So this is how I think that a lot of the tools that we are seeing in AI and in, in, you know, in, in the computational neuroscience side can really help to personalize treatment. So every patient in our trial has a personalized treatment. And with that, we managed to reduce seizures 47%. This is really remarkable. Remember, it's non-invasive. Um, these patients don't have an alternative, it should be surgery, and they have seizures, although they are taking meds. So right now, Neuroelectrics, as a breakthrough designation by the FDA, is doing 190 patients in more than 20 US hospitals, and we aim to become the first company to go through the FDA using this personalized AI-based uh, personalization in patients with epilepsy. But because of the topic of today is depression, um, or mental health, I also wanted to bring the attention that during COVID, we reached out to the FDA and we said, listen, patients with depression cannot go to receive TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation approved in the US. So can we do something at home? And this is where crisis become opportunities because the FDA allow us to do an at-home study with depression patients. So we have been stimulating 33 patients as a pilot in the US uh, during more than a month at home on their own. So they, no physician, no psychiatrist was on site. They were doing this at home. Um, and we, we really managed to have phenomenal results. Unfortunately, because they are not published yet, I cannot disclose the results today, but I can tell you that our MDD pilot trial um, with uh, stimulation at home was very successful and we hope we can move it into a pivotal phase and I'll, I'll send you the paper as soon as I as we publish it. So the idea is that these technologies will be home, home based. And um, the other piece that where I think is relevant to our talk today is that we believe in a future where every one of you who are listening to me will have a digital copy of your brain on the cloud. We call these neuro twins and it's building this electrophysiological and biophysical model of your brain. It's a digital replica of your brain on the cloud so that we can see before we give you a treatment how your brain will respond. So there is a lot of ethical issues in this building of neuro twins, but I think that it's important to take into consideration that as pilots simulate their flights on the cloud, I think, or in simulators, we should do this with the brain as well.
So to close, and I'm, I'll be happy to respond to some more questions uh, during the, the Q&A. It's super hard to go from idea to the market. Um, you know, it's a very long and hard road. If you do deep tech, really, if you do deep tech, and if you work in something like the brain or mental health, brace yourself for a long journey. Uh, where fundraising, regulatory, and reimbursement are key. It's not only the science, it's not only having a cool technology. It's about, do you have enough money to sustain all those years of development? Uh, do you have a good design clinical trial? Will the FDA accept um, your trial? Are payers going to pay for your technology, for your new therapy? And what is the market access? Um, we, as Europeans, I started by bootstrapping and grant money. I think it's great. If you have a product you can sell tomorrow, don't wait to raise money and really be on the market. This is what we do as Neuroelectrics. Um, when we started the company in 2011, we really started to sell our devices to researchers worldwide. And last year, we even made more than $5 million by still selling in 45 countries. Um, and that has given us a discipline to have customer support, to have real clients. So I think it's really good for an entrepreneur to have a real market, even if it's not the market that you're going after. Um, and then grant money. There is so much money in Europe, also in the US, to fund your ideas. So I, I suggest you really look closely. Uh, we've been really fortunate to have the European Commission, European Research Council supporting us. And then raising money, that's another story we can talk in the Q&A, but you have to start early, prepare well, and think big. And don't underestimate the power of networking and perseverance, because knowing who to call, making yourself visible, it's very important. And just a recognition to my team, I couldn't do this with my fantastic team. We are more than 80 people now, many of them women, most of them scientists, uh, based both in US, in Europe, and in Asia. And we keep working every day to solve and help, um, you know, cure diseases that today are not well solved by medication. So thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for <clears throat> sharing your, your experience on building a company, a successful company in neurotechnology, addressing different aspects on, on uh, neurological disorders and mental health. And uh, you touched upon several uh, aspects uh, that we will definitely will uh, come back later on, including the ethics and the global differences that we see uh, when we deal with uh, using artificial intelligence for um, uh, <clears throat> for medical applications or for mental health in particular. And um, this global aspect, uh, uh, I would like to further develop with our next speaker, Dr. Kutoma Wakunuma. Uh, because uh, we have talked about two areas of the world, the, the US and Europe, but global uh, mental health is a global issue. And there are many differences in the research, uh, technological and societal ecosystem across the globe. And Dr. Wakunuma has been uh, studying these uh, differences, uh, in particular on uh, responsible AI in Africa, and I'd like to hear her perspectives of um, what role uh, AI can play in, uh, in mental health and how can we foster a development, a global development of AI as a tool for mental health. Dr. Wakunuma, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I am coming um, uh, at this from a, a social cultural perspective um, with the understanding and, uh, and, and belief, of course, that uh, artificial intelligence is clearly playing a, a very important role uh, in, in mental health. Um, and I think it can also do that uh, in uh, the global South, particularly in Africa, uh, where we there is, um, uh, a, a, a very woeful uh, mental uh, service uh, uh, or a lack of uh, mental health uh, services. So you can imagine uh, the, um, that there is 1.4 uh, mental uh, 
health workers, but 100,000 uh, people uh, compared to, say, for example, nine uh, pay 100,000 uh, in uh, more developed uh, countries. And this, uh, this is uh, from a Lancet a Global uh, Health publication. Um, and this is very, very worrying. So this is where I think uh, and believe that uh, mental um, artificial intelligence can actually play uh, a, a role in actually mitigating this uh, lack of uh, uh, mental health service, which is uh, so desperately needed because uh, Africa is uh, beginning to see uh, a rise in mental health uh, uh, cases. Um, and it's just, it, it, artificial intelligence is, is playing a key role particularly in diagnosing, in, uh, diagnosing um, these mental health uh, cases and to a certain extent uh, uh, providing precision uh, diagnosis uh, depending on um, the type of uh, uh, mental health situation that is uh, being looked at. Um, but I think where the uh, uh, problem is, particularly when it comes to Africa, is that um, the the AI systems that are being used and that are looked at as uh, uh, representative uh, uh, at a global level or that uh, should be able to give a global visibility or to help globally are actually uh, using uh, data or indeed are using data sets that is, has not necessarily been representative of uh, places like, uh, like like Africa. There's very little uh, uh, cultural uh, data uh, that has been uh, collected to inform uh, the use uh, or proper use of artificial intelligence in terms of uh, meeting the, uh, these particular men mental health uh, problems. And this in itself is problematic because then what uh, we see is that there is this expectation to uh, transpose uh, AI systems that work in more developed countries uh, to the expectation that they can work in uh, less developed, uh, developed countries. And this in itself poses uh, issues uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, could see a much more um, wider divide when it comes to artificial intelligence, which then has impact on uh, uh, these technologies are being claimed to be uh, global technologies that can help, for example, to meet uh, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for instance. Um, so rather than trying to help meet these particular UN Sustainable Development Goals, such as uh, health uh, or equalities, what that means with a lack of uh, proper a, a representative data is that there is instead a digital divide, which then exacerbates and delays the meeting of uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, SDGs, uh, particularly in the area of uh, uh, healthcare. The other aspect is really then that uh, there would be an equal distribution of benefits, and there is an equal distribution of. Uh, of benefits. And also the other aspect really is related to then the creation of these uh, asymmetrical power relations, even when the language that is uh, used often is that AI is going to be used for social good and uh, uh, can actually achieve social good. When really, if you look at the grand scheme of things, uh, uh, if we are representing uh, AI uh, through use of data sets that are not representative, uh, uh, we're actually achieving the opposite in that, in that regard. Um, and that in itself can also um, result in inaccurate uh, interpretations or inaccurate uh, uh, diagnosis, um, which then sort of uh, rather than uh, reduce or help to overcome mental health, actually can exacerbate the, the situation. Um, so really the, the, the problem then here uh, becomes uh, uh, also an issue of uh, some kind of uh, maybe neo-colonial uh, situation that is going on because uh, clearly that global say representation of uh, what AI can do is not necessarily global in itself. Uh, and so for me, what I think should be necessary 
is to have a much more inclusive and uh, sustainable, uh, just a minute, I have a, uh, pardon me, I have a call coming in, sorry. Um, so to me, I think what needs to be done is really to, uh, if we're to consider the aspect of mental health, particularly from a global perspective, perspective we need to understand uh, and collect uh, data that is representative of, uh, of uh, a, a global spectrum uh, of, uh, of uh, data of people uh, to then truly have this, um, a, uh, I suppose, a reduction uh, 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 in terms of uh, mental health on a, on a global basis. But I think um, also looking at, a, uh, at it from a global perspective helps us to understand truly understand uh, globally what AI can actually achieve when it comes to mental health, because we cannot necessarily just be looking at or thinking that, you know, the, the data that uh, is uh, being looked at or the works that are being created uh, in uh, the global north, in, in Europe or in America is enough. And so we just leave it, uh, we just leave it there. Uh, we need to be able to understand what is happening on the other side, the other side being the global the global south, in particular Africa and perhaps other, other developing regions as well, then only can we understand the extent of, uh, of mental health and how we can then use artificial intelligence to help overcome um, uh, issues around, uh, around mental health. And then uh, we can truly uh, start looking at, um, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, solutions to overcome uh, this, uh, 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 these mental health uh, issues uh, across the board. Yes, the work that is being done currently is, is, is fantastic, no doubt about that. And I think it can actually be a lot more helpful if we then expanded uh, our interest and our understanding uh, beyond Europe to then truly claim that uh, uh, artificial intelligence can actually help in overcoming uh, uh, mental health because you know, the, these issues are interconnected. We cannot say, you know, uh, the, uh, we cannot separate what is happening in, for example, uh, more developed countries uh, uh, to uh, those uh, in less developed uh, countries. So this is uh, my take. I think it's important to be inclusive and to understand how we can then sort of uh, deal with uh, uh, proper AI governance that is um, uh, inclusive, both socially, culturally, as well as uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding how we can overcome uh, these particular mental health issues at a global level in order to have global impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this global perspective <clears throat> to the use of artificial intelligence for mental health. Uh, and how there is a need of considering this uh, per societal perspective and uh, a, how a global issue should be solved globally. And uh, we'll come back to that in the Q&A to further explore which ways to move forward in that direction. Let me now welcome Dr. Giovanni Briganti to share his experience as both a medical doctor and uh, someone involved in the development of machine learning for mental disorders to give us a, a view of uh, how is the application of AI in the medical practice? How is the influence that these tools may have in uh, the way mental health is treated and how professionals will be used and how can we shape the next steps towards a better integration of these tools into the medical practice. Dr. Breganti, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation. Uh, I will share my screen immediately, uh, hoping that you see it. <clears throat> I think you do. Um, so, um, yeah, um, thank you for the invitation to this very amazing webinar. Um, as explained, I do psychiatry in clinical practice as a medical doctor, and I use artificial intelligence tools to investigate mental disorders uh, to move the field forward as mental disorders as opposed to other uh, medical disorders. Well, we do not know 
how they emerge and uh, if and when they go back to a neutral state of um, mental health. Um, in a nutshell, AI in psychiatry uh, is resumed as my uh, former uh, colleagues that spoke just before me have uh, so eloquently uh, explained. It is uh, resumed into collecting data from different sources, um, do some multimodal feature extraction to identify what is uh, worth uh, taking and uh, train some models and then um, uh, using those models to predict something that is of interest. Uh, now, the data that we use in psychiatry uh, is a uh, synonym for standardized clinical practice, as if you want to collect data in clinical practice of a psychiatry, you need to have a standardized clinical practice. So what is the data in data models that we use in, in, in AI uh, for mental health? Um, well, first is psychometrics, of course, is one of the most important um, sources of uh, data in um, AI models. Uh, we can collect them in an easy way when we look at patients in clinical practice, for instance, when they are hospitalized or in ambulatory settings. Uh, myself, I focus on severe mental disorders with patients that are um, committed into hospitalizations by force or that are hospitalized for other reasons. Uh, and so I focus on uh, collecting behavioral measures to model how they behave. Uh, biological parameters, pharmacological data are also very important sources of data as we can objectify more um, yeah, um, uh, measures of mental health in other way. And we see that, for instance, with the uh, gut microbiota or uh, biological blood uh, parameters, we can uh, use several, several of them to model mental health. Pharmacological data in, 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 uh, in particular can help us as it is quantifiable data and quantitative data that we collect either way in, in hospitals when we know what medication has been administered and how much of the dose. So this can help us in um, shaping dashboards that can uh, help us better treat patients in the, in the future. Um, so electrophysiology, and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, Neuroelectrics uh, was uh, so brilliantly represented today, is, is a very important step into um, uh, collecting uh, dimensional uh, uh, dimension quantitative data of the uh, electrophysiology of the patient. And this can be coupled in virtual twin models as it was represented for the neuro twin uh, solution. Um, the uh, demographic data is also can be important as with social data. So uh, how do I use AI in psychiatry? Uh, first, I use AI to study complexity uh, that is build uh, uh, models to investigate mental disorders uh, such as depression, bipolar disorders, psychosis, but also psychological constructs such as empathy, self-worth, etc. This complexity can help us study how symptoms and signs of mental disorders connect and how we, they can emerge together um, as well as they able to not emerge together. And so the study of uncertainty and the complexity of mental disorders is very useful as we come from a field where uh, we have some uh, hard set manuals that describe how mental disorders should appear, but in clinical practice, it does not appear that way. So uh, yeah, we can study uncertainty as well. Um, Granger causality is a phenomenon that is 50 years old now, but uh, that um, is coming uh, back to force in mental health with studying temporal dependencies uh, between behavioral, uh, behavioral measures such as symptoms and identify how symptoms at a time zero are influencing symptoms at a successive time one. Uh, we can use uh, AI to predict uh, how symptoms predict each other uh, and uh, how much of a variance of a symptom is explained by surrounding symptoms. Uh, we can use AI to improve existing psychometric tools, for instance, uh, that we administer patients every day, but there are too long, for instance, and detect redundancies and detect communities of symptoms, uh, for instance, in bipolar disorders, we conducted a study to identify if there were some communities of uh, symptoms of bipolar disorders. And if those communities were stable, as we progressed through the treatment regimen, and, and they were actually. And so detecting how symptoms co-appear together is another cool uh, part of using AI in, in psychiatry. 
So uh, th this last part, uh, hypothesis generation, is one I like very much as it helps me uh, generate many, many prediction models at once using uh, Bayesian networks or kind of machine learning algorithms that help us um, identify the plausible uh, causal connections among symptoms. And this can be done with any set of symptoms. And so hy hypothesis generation is particularly key in psychiatry as it is a field that has a hard time moving forward and evolve. Um, yeah, so smartphone use is particularly useful in, in mental health as we can collect data from a passive way. And as uh, some of my colleagues were explaining before, it can be an important source of complete data to collect it in a passive way with the uh, agreement uh, and ethical approval um, for the patient. Uh, ecological momentary assessment is, of course, a very hot topic in behavioral health right now, as we can collect measures over time and uh, build personalized models of behavioral uh, symptoms. Uh, facial recognition is a, an, ethical, an ethically risky uh, area of AI and mental health, but we do uh, and we are incorporating it. So some people are incorporating it into practices of uh, forensic psychiatry, for instance. Uh, I will not extend myself on studying the brain because the people from Icometrics are 10 times more uh, brilliant than I am for explaining so. Um, multimodal AI is, in, in the end, uh, a clear um, uh, high-impact uh, way of moving forward the field of psychiatry. And as my colleagues from uh, Neuroelectrics, uh, uh, Dr. Mikes was explaining, uh, it is uh, definitely the way to move the field forward, incorporating different sources of data. Uh, what is happening right now in the field that everybody is sticking to his own specialty, electrophysiology or behavior or uh, biology, but we need to cross the roads and build multimodal models that cross levels and uh, move beyond. So yeah, as a take-home message is, yeah, AI is changing psychiatry for the better. It is allowing us to better understand and treat mental disorders, and you can join in the revolution. And if I can help you in some way, uh, please let me know. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for this uh, presentation uh, <clears throat> on the specific use of AI in psychiatry and some um, ways in which uh, we can use these tools for studying and better understanding of mental disorders. And uh, let me now remind uh, the attendees that you can also put your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom or through the chat in the YouTube channel. And right now we are entering into a general discussion about uh, the topic that we have been uh, discussing today, where we have uh, looked at uh, how can you, we use AI to create models that help us understanding the <clears throat> uh, underlying phenomena for uh, mental health, mental disorders, and neurological situations to develop uh, or identify biomarkers, uh, therapies, as well as the challenges of doing this at the global level and translating the scientific discoveries into actual solutions that have impact in the world. And um, to start, uh, I would like to ask um, a question on the reliability of the biomarkers. As uh, we may have seen in the last weeks with uh, all the brouhaha regarding ChatGPT and language models, we have seen how some of these models can present uh, um, wrong information in a very convincing ways. And uh, this uh, leads us to the question of robustness. And uh, I would like then to start discussing how can we currently develop robust biomarkers uh, for mental health? How can we... Uh, identify them, how can we assess them and validate them? And what tools do we have today and what are the elements missing if uh, we want to take this one step further? And this is an open, open question to uh, different uh, people in the panel. I can, I, can, I can maybe begin uh, in a very simple but concise way is that uh, we need to leverage the power of AI uh, to um, generate research hypotheses uh, that much quickly over biological markers. Um, and um, 
the, the, the problem is that right now we are just using uh, most of the time AI models to sticking to predicting things, whether we should be sticking to uh, leveraging what do we have as um yeah uh, as a um as potential biomarkers that could work and to leverage on that to perform a hypothesis generation uh the fact that we have been conducting clinical studies uh, for so long to detecting that biomarker or that biomarker um it, it is uh, it, it has uh, drained us of our force of researching for uh, in, in in mental health um psychiatry has been proven to be quite resistant to identify for identifying for instance is one common cause and one biomarker that could be uh, responsible for that or this disease. Uh, but yeah, I think we can use algorithms to uh, improve the and speed up the research process. Thank you, Fanny. Yeah, I'm more conservative in AI. And you know, you know me, Ricardo, I participate a lot of the ethical um, debate. So I think that when you're dealing, when, when we are dealing with the brain, especially in biomarkers and all the digital apps in mental health, I am I am a bit concerned, um, you know, on what is the, the robustness, but also the efficacy of those biomarkers, right? And my company is under the watch of the FDA. We need to do clinically, you know, randomized clinical trials with a sham arm. You know, you need to do a statistically nice study. So I think that to me, when we are talking about mental health and the patient, I think that in many instances, you know, there is all this kind of scientific regulation to go after and it gives you the credibility, right? And in mental health, I'm very worried about, um, you know, all these tools that are online, all these companies that provide mental health support in the form of coaches. There has been a lot of debate in the US on, you know, I understand you can have recommendations on having a healthier lifestyle, but the, the boundaries between, you know, wellness and mental health um, can be blurry. And when you have a coach or somebody on the other line of a digital app or claiming a biomarker dealing with a major depressive patient, I think that's where things get super sophisticated and complicated. I mean, are we... Are we training our organisms, but are we training our people also to deal with this kind of population, right? So I think there is a lot of ethics, not only in the AI generation, but the way those tools are delivered to the patients and to the population. And I think we have to be careful because, you know, I, I was presented today to my team, the MDD uh, pilot results, and I'm very happy that there was no suicidal ideation, that all my patients were safe, but I worry about these things. And I'm under an FDA very carefully oversight study, right? And I am a manufacturer of medical devices. I still worry because, you know, you're dealing with people that are very delicate in their health. It's not like, you know, it's, it's a problematic disease. Mental health, I think, requires a different level of you know, of careful thought to how we are developing tools, how are we validating them and how we are delivering them to the population. Yeah, I think that's a very important point on, on having a clear rules on first this, um, <clears throat> this uh, division between proven tools and proven uh, approaches using technology to address mental health. And right now we see this boom on, on apps related to mental health. It is estimated that about uh, 10,000 apps are currently available in the Apple Store and Google Play Store for mental health. And the vast majority is not evidence um, support. So I think it, this is something important for, for all of us who are working in this field to have a clear rules and also better ways to communicate how these systems are validated and under which rules. Maybe Simon, you would like all to add um, also a bit from your perspective. Yes, gladly. And I fully agree with what uh, Anna mentioned before. Um, similar to Neuroelectrics, we are, of course, also bound by uh, FDA oversight, which I am fully supportive of. We have to prove quantitatively that what we are measuring in the brain, uh, in our case, uh, brain volumes or, or um, atrophy of certain brain structures, 
that we can properly validate those against a reference uh, such as manual alineation uh, by an expert radiologist, for example. So we have several ways in which we benchmark our measurements so that they are indeed reliable and we can objectively, uh, we can show that they are really objective uh, and, um, and correct, or at least uh, within a predefined uh, error margin, all those uh, engineering terms, which, uh, which we like, but which are, I think, uh, very necessary. And uh, indeed, I think that there's a role for, not for companies themselves, but for uh, researchers to provide um, mental health biomarkers that are more direct. Our company is, of course, measuring it indirectly via um, uh, the evolution of, of volumes in the brain or abnormalities in the brain. But um, I think we are also indeed waiting as a field for objective markers for mental health that could be turned into a medical device that uh, can be objectively um, measured and, and approved. Thank you very much. Katama. Yes, I, I was just going to add uh, to the fact that, uh, yeah, these um, mental uh, health apps, which are just in, in, in large numbers, it's very, very easy for people to, to believe in them and not necessarily to go out and seek proper, uh, uh, proper help because technology, for, especially for lay people, is very believable. It is, after all, something that has been developed uh, for to make positive change, to improve uh, our lives, and you know to just make everything very efficient. And um, for uh, developing uh, countries where there's a lack of um, uh, or a limited lack of a limited uh, mental health uh, service, uh, for a lot of people when they see this, because uh, technology is, is is has become almost like a lifesaver, you know. Uh, you have all this information on uh, these smartphones that uh, everyone is uh, is using because all these these uh, phones are ubiquitous now. Everybody has access to them, and so they are using all these uh, applications. And why not believe in them? You know, they're there. They've been developed. They're on the phone, and they should be okay. They're providing all this type of information, and yet. These may not necessarily be the right uh, technologies to help with mental health. Perhaps, if anything, they may actually be exacerbating um, mental health issues. And so it's very, very uh, important to kind of uh, look at uh, how these can be uh, managed, you know, what sort of uh, structures are being put in place, particularly not only from a policy maker's point of view, but also from the developers themselves. Uh, and, and here I'm also thinking about uh, very young, impressionable people uh, who might be using these uh, uh, technologies and are really believing in them, what it might actually be doing for their mental health. Uh, rather than you know, helping out, it may actually be uh, you know, increasing um, uh, their mental health uh, issues. So yeah, it's something that needs to be looked at. Yes, so I think here we are entering into the this tension that we have on the, <clears throat> the opportunities that the, this technology can bring. And uh, the risk that uh, the, um, their capabilities can be overestimated or can be misrepresented by <clears throat> either um, naive or malicious uh, people. I think it also can make us an entry into the issue of regulation. We are now in a in a moment where there are these developing uh, regulatory frameworks for artificial intelligence and um, we certainly in, involve uh, some of the tools that we have been discussing, some of them will fall within the medical uh, regulation, others may be in a gray zone or, or outside there. But besides that, we will also face a different uh, regulatory frameworks across the globe. And um, that's one of the questions uh, we, we discussed before that there was a need to have a global wide data in order to build appropriate models that can be used to address mental health issues. But at the same time, there are concerns uh, about uh, how this data will be used, what in which uh, frameworks can be uh, they 
properly analyzed or shared, and uh, what is uh, allowed or not in different jurisdictions. And I, I would like to hear your, your opinions briefly on this issue. How can we address that if we want a global uh, contribution from technology to improving mental health? How these emerging regulatory frameworks uh, can contribute or or uh, make uh, constitute a hurdle to this um, to this progress? Hmm. Um, I don't yeah. know if I can if I can start. Um, yeah, please go ahead. I, I, it's interesting you you mentioned uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, I think one question is whose regulatory uh, frameworks are we looking at, especially when we're looking at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, AI from a global perspective. Uh, the reason why I ask this is because um, I think for the most part, a lot of uh, African uh, countries uh, haven't, don't necessarily even have uh, the regulatory frameworks or robust regulatory frameworks uh, to put it in. Um, uh, in that in that manner, um, so what is being done is that there is there are recipients of uh, these uh, um, AI systems that they then uh, use um, that are seen as global and so should be okay. Um, but then if something happens, so for example, and we're talking about a medical uh, uh, the medical arena there and uh, you know uh, the, there's a lot of collection of uh, uh, patient uh, data now if something goes wrong uh, with these uh, systems uh, one wonders who is uh, to to blame or indeed who actually is managing this data and how is this data being managed and where do uh, where does one tend to uh, when something goes wrong with uh, patient uh, data or falls into, in, into the wrong hands, especially when you're looking at it from uh, uh, less developed uh, countries who are just really just, uh, who are just uh, receiving or in receipt of this particular technology without necessarily having uh, input in how they are developed in how they are designed and indeed how they can be, they can be deployed. So um, yeah, that, uh, is something that is concerning and perhaps ought to be looked at uh, uh, much more close, closely if we're going to be talking about uh, uh, these uh, frameworks from a global uh, perspective. Thank you. And from a, a... I, I think that, yeah, one thing that worries me is that a lot of the, I can only speak for the neurotech companies that we've been called, for example, into Washington like uh, a month ago and, and I think that as a company that was born in Europe, scale up in the US and have also operations in, in Asia, what worries me is all this, not only the regulation, but this debate on the technological sovereignty, right? Whether governments are going to want to own and put uh, borders uh, to some of this technology. And this this can be very difficult for what we are trying to do because I am European, my investors are US, my workforce comes from many. So it's the war of talent. The moment you start to put the barriers up, you start to restrict you know, the talent pool. So I think that we are going to see more and more and Europe is the same, You know how uh, governments are going to become and territories much more protective on this kind of technology and claiming their national assets. And I think that goes beyond regulation. Um, so I think it's happening in the US strongly, but it's happening in Europe as well. And we are seeing with the war in China, right? So I don't know what the, what the table thinks, but I think that neurotech is one of the, you know, and, and, and therapies for mental health and things like that. This can have, um, a very strange uh, future depending on how uh, controlling and how uh, of a national security they made these kind of technologies, right? So that's kind of strange for an entrepreneur. I don't know what the table thinks about that. Yes, I am being aware of this uh, particular evol evolution in the neurotechnology sector 
and uh, also in the AI sector, how discussions about uh, national security sometimes uh, start to, to cross with uh, the, the discussion, the promotion of research and innovation. I guess this is one of the elements that uh, may play into the future of this application. I think we have seen in the discussion certain certain topics emerging. One is the, the need for developing robust uh, uh, biomarkers to estimate uh, them not in a small uh, population, but more at a global level to address issues of bias, fairness, and equity. And how the, um, the current frameworks being developed may or may not be conducent to a thriving scenario. And here, I guess, is a, something that we need to, to, to get more involved and to also don't forget that there are these issues that may affect how can we contribute to mental health through the development of technology. And I, I would like to, to take some questions from the, from the audience. Uh, as we have been talking about the reliability of biomarkers, there is a question on which factors uh, uh, do we need to consider to evaluate the human satisfaction with an AI system? And uh, this was uh, directed to Giovanni, but I think it's, uh, it's something that other, other people here can, can contribute. Uh, I think we, we may be familiar with some metrics from the machine learning um, uh, field, but there, are, there is something more than that. How do we assess a system that is, uh, that is using AI as a tool for mental health? Well, uh, well, of course, it depends on, it depends on the system itself. It depends on one the system to the task at hand and and third of course uh, the, uh, the the um, uh, the the use case uh, of course uh, current uh, performance uh, measures are not often used and and uh, performed by uh, to, to my opinion uh, machine learning companies uh, that are distributed onto European soil. Um, often I have uh, encountered uh, startups and scale-ups that um, that have presented uh, software to uh, say uh, directions of hospitals or uh, healthcare organizations, and they didn't have the classical metrics to evaluate the models that they use to perform a tax X or Y, and that I find quite a pity because <clears throat> it subtracts to the effort of uh, building uh, safe, uh, trustworthy and, and safe uh, AI models. This is uh, echoed at a larger scale uh, on uh, scientific findings is that the large and vast majority of um, um, AI studies in the literature are not mm. uh, replicated and do not receive a primary replication. So, um, yeah, as, a, as an advice to uh, people from uh, the business uh, and private sector, um, yeah, validate and, and, and test out your models in mental health and psychiatry as a, as a large to um, evaluate at, 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 uh, at a basis the, the, main, uh, the main metrics of evaluating models um, that, that your technicians will know how to do. Uh, and second, to perform uh, replication studies in other samples and the initial tools to, um, to, yeah, to move the field forward. Um, that is uh, uh, a first advice. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Any other um, uh, feedback on how, which factor shall we include uh, when we evaluate these systems? Maybe what I wanted to bring something related to this question um, for Simon when you mentioned that you have a collection of um, curated material on medical imaging for patients and our stakeholders. Uh, I wanted to ask if there is a possibility for the patients to also contribute that and to provide feedback. And uh, this goes to the involvement of patients and stakeholders in the in these type of tools and uh, <clears throat> that you are developing right now. Um, your question relates to feedback of the patient with regards to the uh, app or the website that they can use or about their personal experience of the disease or? So in, in the different elements in which they can contribute to the, to the development of the solutions that you are working on right now. Oh, right, right. Uh, so on the one hand, we do have indeed an educational platform called ALTS Imaging, uh, specifically targeting uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, provides curated content that can um, 
be a reliable source of information for uh, lay people, such as the patients themselves, uh, um, uh, oftentimes, and family. On the other hand, uh, patients can use our iCompanion app, which is very much interactive and in which there's uh, two-way traffic, so to speak. So patients can use this app to log their symptoms, to keep a, a diary of um, how they feel, which can really provide valuable feedback for uh, their, um, their treating uh, physicians, uh, radiologists and neurolog neurologists. Of course, in this app, the patient will also then um, himself or herself see information uh, regarding their own brain scans. So it's really a, a two-way flow of information, but this uh, patient logging and uh, the cognitive uh, tests that patients can do inside the app can really also provide very valuable uh, information that can directly impact their own individual care, but also the development of um, future solutions that can more accurately um, track or monitor how the patient is doing and whether um, a modification of the treatment might be needed. Thank you. And uh, so there are uh, some questions regarding whether you have been uh, looking or studying uh, issues related to long COVID syndrome. That's uh, also a very interesting question. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have been involved in a large-scale European project to uh, address the immediate need of uh, screening based on uh, lung CT scans. So no longer brain scans, but uh, scans of the chest of the lungs to quickly uh, allow to triage patients uh, that needed um, immediate uh, intubation um, or, or intensive care um, uh, hospitalization. Long COVID is uh, now more and more becoming a primary concern. So uh, patients that experience uh, symptoms many uh, months or years after having passed through a uh, COVID infection. And I think for now, very little is known about the impact of uh, long-term uh, uh, long uh, COVID on both the lungs, but also on the brain. Uh, we are currently not yet um, involved in any development in that regard, but we would be very interested. And we also believe that our uh, automated um, brain scan measurements can really contribute something here. Uh, we believe that they're generically applicable since uh, we provide measurements of many brain structures and some of them probably correlate to, um, to these long-term uh, symptoms of long COVID. Uh, so in that sense, indeed, so very interested, uh, but not yet actively uh, involved. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have uh, a continuous stream of questions. Uh, thank you very much to all the attendants uh, <clears throat> that uh, continue to answer. We may not have time to address them all today, but uh, we remember that we will have another session on Wednesday on the impact of AI on our mental health at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Central European time. And we'll try also to uh, get back to some of the questions that we don't have time uh, today to address. Uh, continuing on the evaluation of uh, the systems, uh, uh, there is there are now the development of um, ethical assessments of uh, different uh, systems, including AI-based systems. And uh, one of our uh, attendees is, uh, is curious uh, on whether you are currently integrating or considering the integration of these ethical assessments in the, into your solutions uh, and uh, products beyond the, the, the standard IRBs that are used for, for research. Yeah, I think that in my field, Ricardo, if I may, there has been a lot of debate about neuroethics. And there are two sides. I mean, there is people like Rafa Yuste in Colombia who claims that this should be in the Bill of Rights as a right of us as humans uh, to be brain protected, right? Um, so this is kind of like an extreme view, but very interesting. And I think some countries like Chile and others are starting to put this as a right. Um, but the other side is me as the industry, I believe we should at least have some guidelines on ethical gui guidelines on where to develop our technologies. And um, there, we are not obliged. I mean, we are obliged today to comply with FDA regulations or EU regulations, but on the ethical side, there is not such a regulation. 
But I think that um, it's up to the governments to decide uh, if they want to strengthen those regulations. But at least I think the industry should syndicate around guidelines on the difficult questions, you know, when you're, when you're uh, developing neurotech. For example, I thought I was a very good CEO by doing FDA trials and so on, but then I met the neuroethicist and they start to ask me questions like, for example, Anna, is your device changing identity or autonomy or agency of a patient? And that nobody asks you in a clinical trial, right? So there are questions that go beyond medical um, about accessibility, about, so there is a lot of ethical questions that if you don't, don't meet people who are in this field, you hardly ask yourself, right? Because you're so focused on efficacy, right? Um, so I think it's very important for the industry to be aware, especially for the people that are working in implanted devices. And uh, because once you open a scalp and insert something in someone's brain that stays there for like almost forever, right? So I think that we should discuss more and people are very flash about, you know, neurotech but I think that especially the young people should be asking themselves whether those devices are protecting them in the way they should, right? Um, so I think that's, it's very important, I think, for the industry and for the, uh, you know, in general, for the uh, potential customers to be aware of what they are. I mean, it's not like a social media consenting, right? This is <laughs> another dimension mm -hmm. yeah. of, you know, brain access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was just going to add uh, that uh, I think it's it's uh, also important to make uh, lay lay people, you know, recipients of these uh, medical devices aware of uh, you know the potentials, but not only the potentials, but also uh, you know what can go wrong with these particular devices. Um, and I think that's very, very important in terms of being transparent in order to then have uh, an AI that is trustworthy. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, <clears throat> what is happening is that uh, um, everything is left to maybe policymakers, as, as I alluded to earlier, uh, and also um, uh, developers. And then once you know the technology is developed and you know policymakers kind of give a tick in a sense, because I suppose they too need to, to have proper awareness, then you know it becomes kind of mainstream and everyone thinks it's okay without necessarily understanding what the implications are. And um, it, it's very important that lay people do understand uh, the, 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 the impact, the, the, the consequences, uh, if at all. And I think awareness is key. Uh, to then making it uh, going, moving towards uh, uh, an ethical understanding that can then be uh, uh, looked at, that can then allow the, the devices to be trustworthy from the point of view of, uh, uh, of lay people. Yeah, thank you very much. And so you mentioned the, the importance to get um, potential users and patients aware and and of these tools, uh, how they work, how they are reliable. But uh, <clears throat> let's um, also include in the discussion the clinical practitioners. And so this uh, goes to the next question that we got from the YouTube channel. Uh, what are currently available tools for clinical practitioners? Uh, if there, you can point out to some examples of tools or resources that clinical practitioners that are uh, addressing mental health today can use or, or the, where they can get more information. Is there any example that comes to your minds? That's an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we, we can we can start by by looking at what is the um, so what are the current applications and where that you see entering into the market and being available 
for clinical practitioners. So some of you have, uh, have mentioned your, uh, your specific cases and, and companies on using transcranial magnetic stimulation, neuroimaging. Can we further develop on what other um, uses of AI are, are at the level of maturity that is high enough for clinical practitioners to, to start looking at it? I can maybe maybe start as a clinical practitioner myself. Uh, <clears throat> well, of course, um, when 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 we to answer the formal question, I thought it was directed to Simon. That that is why I, I didn't uh, I didn't speak before. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, there there are currently um, uh, many solutions on the market, but few are implemented into uh, clinical practice because they 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 have they are siloed. <clears throat> You either have um, uh, applications for uh, measuring behavior, or you have uh, applications to uh, treat with uh, mental health, uh, mental health variables. Uh, you have applications that uh, produce some kind of um, chatbot-assisted therapy, uh, and um, the problem with many of them is that they do not assess and they do not answer to the needs of. Uh, uh, the reality of clinical practice and the reality of clinical practice is that when we as clinical practitioners receive patients in, into either ambulatory or hospital uh, settings, they are much, much more severe uh, than the applications that are um, currently on the market allow us to uh, take in charge. And so I would never dream of, uh, for instance, um, um, prescribing uh, a chatbot assisted therapy app to a, a severe bipolar patient or a severe psychotic patient or a, or a severe uh, uh, whatever else um, depressive or anxious patient. So that is that is the the reality um, of uh, the the market, uh, but there are uh, more applications destined for uh, say uh, clinical practitioners and hospitals without the involvement of patients, and those are um, generally much more advanced. And we, we have two uh, we have two examples here on on on, on the chat today uh, with us. So uh, Icometrics and and um, the, the products from uh, Neuroelectrics are much more mature than uh, because they they uh, they. Use usually are uh, destined uh, for the clinical practitioners themselves without the um the the, the input of uh, of patients that is a, um that is one one general commentary that i wanted to to give yeah, thanks uh, that uh, maybe something to add simon yeah of course since uh, icometrics is mainly focused on very um quantitative measurements of uh, brain structures and, and abnormalities in the brain, I find it hard to immediately translate this to a um, mental uh, health app or direct uh, app targeting mental health. So in, in that sense, I, I think uh, Giovanni gave an excellent um, view on, on it. Um, we, of course, are happy to support where we can. We try to do it in a certain sense via our um, our patient app, uh, but it is uh, far from addressing a direct uh, mental health uh, condition. We always uh, focus on the on a primary neurological uh, condition first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we also see here a difference between the different of applications of AI for mental health and and neurological conditions, and um, how the these different applications are at different stages in their development and, and therefore the, the maturity or the likelihood that they generate a specific impact will vary as well. And this, uh, this may, may lead to one of the other questions that we have from the attendees uh, uh, that uh, says that some mental health AI apps such as uh, Wisau Robot are behaving as almost therapists uh, but yet we don't know how they collect the data, how accurately they are predicting. But maybe there is some uh, some reactions from you on on this. Uh, although we already touched a little bit on on these um, health related apps. So, what's the take on this, uh, res this emergence of um, virtual therapists or AI supported therapists? And what would be, in your opinion, the um, the things to do and the things to avoid doing if we are trying to develop or to use one of these uh, uh, these applications. 
So yeah, very very quickly from a clinical pr uh, practice point of view, uh, the, the negative side of the um, health tech um, market being and 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 debates being dominated by people who are not in in healthcare is that we uh, we we have on the market products that answer to needs that nobody has. Um, and, um, and, and, and if people that are uh, wanting to, to, uh, building a mental health startup just spent one week in, um, uh, in clinical departments, uh, as interns or, uh, to observe, to observe, um, or to include, uh, mental health professionals as, uh, co-founders, uh, they would produce apps that, uh, are actually answering to the needs of patients and practitioners about. So, uh, one, one, uh, one advice that, um, uh, first advice that I give is that most, uh, therapy assisted, um, um, well, uh, therapy, therapeutic chat box, uh, they are trained on data that just not does, does not make sense from a clinical practice and does not uh, accompany patients as they should. Um, and as uh, those bots, many, many mental health apps uh, do not uh, do not answer to real needs. So that would be one uh, clear message for today. If you want to find if you want to found um, a, a mental health care startup, just either uh, co-founded with healthcare mental healthcare professionals or don't because uh, you are likely to um, to develop something that nobody needs and it will be difficult for you to access the market. Um, yeah, that's uh, that was uh, quite an interesting uh, question, especially with regards to uh, you know the data that is being collected and 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 what they're doing with that with that data. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, who is managing that data, and you know where are they storing that data? Um, because if if they are collecting data that is not necessarily useful, but it is personal data. Who knows what they can do with that data that is not necessarily useful for the patient, but could be used in, in, in different uh, uh, other ways. And so uh, trying to advise people about what they ought to do is a bit difficult, especially when you're in that state of believing that uh, uh, these uh, therapy uh, systems uh, are indeed very it can offer what 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 you, what you need, especially if you really need that particular uh, uh, clinical help. And again, this is where the aspect of awareness comes in, and also the dangers that these uh, uh, technologies uh, also might actually might actually have. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that this question has been um, asked, and I think it is important that you know we consider uh, these answers. I don't know that uh, we can answer, or would that we have the proper answers, or to the satisfaction that uh, the, the 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 person asking um, wants us to 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 provide. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. As we enter into the the end. Of, uh, of this panel. I would like to thank you all for uh, joining us today, uh, especially the panelists for sharing your experience, your perspectives, uh, your concerns and hopes. And uh, we have seen how there are multiple ways in which we can use artificial intelligence to address this global challenge that is mental health. There are definitely, definitely many opportunities for leveraging this technology for the social good, and uh, some take-home uh, message that, that I, I keep uh, from different interventions is uh, first that we, we should uh, think about developing solutions to someone's needs and uh, to not uh, start uh, only by the technology and the enthusiasm, but to go and address uh, the potential users, the domain experts, and this, there is a need to better and closer interaction between AI experts and domain experts so that we can have a, a better steering of this technology. And uh, the translation of the scientific discovery into real world solutions uh, entails challenges that uh, shouldn't be underestimated. And uh, it's not a direct translation. There are differences 
uh, depending on the country, depending on the situation where you are, that made this process more or less difficult, but it's never straightforward. And uh, also how as the mental health is a global issue, it needs to be addressed at a global level. From the point of view of the data that is used, the models that are developed, the capacities that are created and the regulatory frameworks that are used and put in place. And then overall, the trustworthiness of these systems is crucial for the appropriate addressing of the challenges that mental health is uh, raising today. And uh, we have now two minutes, uh, which give us a little less than 30 seconds to each of our panelists for your closing statement. Uh, and uh, let me thank you again. And uh, I'll go in the same order in which uh, you presented and final statement for our audience today. Simon. Thank you. Yes, uh, I will. I will end with um, stressing again that uh, mental health is often tied to to other factors. In our case, we look at the relation between mental health and neurological disorders, and um, uh, I, I liked really very much the the statement by my colleague Anna here uh, that we should focus really on um, quantifiable um, and measurable um, uh, factors that we can control or can reliably uh, estimate to contribute to the care of uh, these different disorders, both on the physiological and the mental level. Thank you. Anna? I think that I just wanted to point out that um, AI can be a great tool to help in mental health. Uh, which is a disease that requires as many innovation and as much advancement as we can because there are more and more people suffering every day. But I think we need to deal with AI and mental health in a responsible and transparent way. Thanks, Anna. Kudama? Well, first of all, let me begin by uh, you know, saying thank you to uh, my fellow panelists for uh, uh, you know, inspiring uh, presentations. And uh, I've, I've learned quite a lot. Um, uh, well, the only thing I can say is that um, AI it, it can truly be uh, a fantastic tool uh, that can help uh, with uh, mental health. But at the same time, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, we need to be able to understand from the point of view of the, the different uh, data sets that we can collect in terms of how uh, AI can be uh, can help in uh, looking at mental health from different uh, uh, global perspectives, particularly with respect to developing countries. I think we need to do more in that uh, area so that uh, a, a meeting the challenges of mental health can actually be a truly gro a global achievement that can help in terms of uh, a, a overcoming uh, these particular issues uh, across, uh, across the globe. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, yes, as a closing statement, if you want to uh, find uh, and found a mental health solution, uh, build an ecosystem first, including mental health professionals, and um, correctly conduct validation studies uh, that prove that your solution is worth something. And I also would like to thank my fellow panelists and Claire for the wonderful invitation to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss and share on this important issue of AI as a tool for mental health. This conversation will continue on Wednesday at 10 European Central Time with an all question asked on the impact of AI on our well being. Thank you very much. I'm Ricardo Chavarriaga. I had the pleasure to moderate this panel today and uh, looking forward to the second part of the discussion on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.